Good evening, everyone. And Rohini, thank you for doing this. Thank you, Sunil, for doing this, actually. And thanks to Aima. You know, I got called yesterday that I, you may have to do a fireside chat with Rohini and then also with Nandita. I said two firebrand women in one <laughs> evening is, is a bit of a handful, so I shall stick to one. So, let me start with you as a person, because you have been in many ways a very public person mm -hmm. and in also many ways a very private person. Mm -hmm. You're a prolific author. You run amazing initiatives on the, on the philanthropic side. You're a pioneer in many things you do. I was trying to figure out what is it that drives you I was reading about your grandfather the other day, uh, who got driven by Mahatma Gandhi's message and actually set, set up his first ashram, I believe. Yep. So, and, and he worked closely with uh, Kasturba Gandhi to focus also on sanitation and education. Is that part of your driver? Is it some of it genetic that drives you? I don't know if the genes pass such things on, but culture certainly does. So in my family, we were always, you know, in those days when I was um, young, in the uh, 60s, uh, the term simple living and high thinking was something that, uh, of course, this was pre-liberalization, so everyone had to do simple living anyway. But, but the high thinking part we took rather seriously. And my f grandfather's legacy was very much held to us as a positive example of how you should live your life. So I was very inspired definitely by that. Uh, I understand your grandson Tanush was the inspiration for a couple of your books. Oh yes. And for a lot of my work because yep. what is the world we are going to leave for the grandchildren and the great grandchildren, right? That's something I think the minute you become a grandparent, I think today that's the first thing you think about. It, it kind of tends to change our behavior and, and also in some ways how you look at the world. Um, back again to your writing. You've been writing books and, and some wonderful stuff. I've managed to read some of them. Um, I find, however, lots and lots of people are very happy and comfortable just reading off a little bit off a screen, off the net, on WhatsApp messages and all and, and, and the like. Do you think the habit and culture of reading is actually going away? Do you believe it's something we need to hold and protect? Actually, I don't think it's going away. I think reading is absolutely critical. Wherever I go, I tell young mothers, I tell grandmothers, the first gift to a child should be a book. Actually, when the mother has a child in a womb, she should start reading to him or her. Um, reading is absolutely critical to put yourself on the path of self-learning and there is no path more empowering than the self-learning path. So reading is critical. I don't think people are reading less. If you look at the sale of books worldwide, if you look at Pratham Books, which I co-founded in 2004, today has we've created an open pub, uh, 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 creative commons platform called Story Weaver. And today it has more than 26 million reads, 3, 000, more than 55,000 stories in 340 languages contributed wow. to all over, from all over the world. So right. people are reading, children are reading and parents are helping them to read. Right. But reading is so critical, I'll just say one thing, a reading nation is a thinking nation, a thinking nation is a nation that is going to innovate and progress. So reading is critical, yes. That is fantastic, by the way. Congratulations. And it's, it's tremendous work. I mean, work. there's a great team doing that now. Oh, yeah. Yep. Yep. But the leader does get the credit. Yeah. So since Nandan is here as well, I'm going to ask you a question about Infosys. And, and, and also, uh, Nandan always said that he was an accidental entrepreneur. As you said, you're an accidental philanthropist. Um, many people said, what actually made Infosys was not just these founders, but it was these strong, powerful, purposeful women behind these men. In, in each of their cases, something significant was done, either a big sacrifice or, or to support uh, the spouses to help build this company. I, I read somewhere that Sudha Murthy gave 
Narayan Murthy alone, and, and you did some, some such similar thing. So how was those days uh, for you when the early days of the struggle of setting up a new enterprise of Infosys was, was the norm, was the day, uh, day in and day out for you? This was 1981. In 1980, they took the decision. 1981 was when Infosys was set up. It was also the year Nandana and I got married. So two big things happened in our life together. I tell you, it was a momentous journey. Both were like roller coasters. And, uh, you know, the idea of Infosys dominated our lives. It was much bigger than anything else we wanted to do or could do in our personal lives. We saw the dedication of the founders. And uh, we supported them. I used to be a chauffeur, I used to be a cook. We used to have young technic engineers staying with us. And I used to worry about them like a mother and they were very young, you know. And uh, it was great. We were young, we were free, carefree. Uh, we could afford to take the risks. Of course, Nandan and others worked extremely hard, 24 by 7. They weren't really there. But uh, I wouldn't call it a sacrifice. It was a great learning journey. And by God's grace, uh, Infosys was successful. Um, but even if it hadn't been, we would have done the same thing and backed our spouses in exactly the same way. So it was an adventure. It, oh, it was a total adventure. Yeah. Yep. So you wrote this very interesting book about Samaj, Sarkar, and the Bazaar. Clearly, three great influences on our lives, on policy making, on, on action, on what actually happens. Uh, the COVID pandemic that we went through recently was a wonderful example of the ability to work together, but doesn't happen often enough and doesn't happen, doesn't seem to have a natural smoothness to its functioning. What do you think we ought to do to improve the rough edges in this relationship? Yeah, thank you for that question. For me, this, this trifecta of Samaj Sarkar Bazaar is very important, but I think Samaj comes first, and I do want to reiterate that to everybody. Um, Delhi is a lot about uh, the political space, the Sarkar space, but I do believe that even if you're a CM, even if you're a CEO or anything else, you are part of the Samaj first. You're a citizen first. So every evening we do have to take out our other role hats and come back to being a human and a citizen first. So how we are as citizens and what is the leadership, because AIMA is a lot about management and leadership, the kind of leaders that we want in the bazaar and the sarkar are going to come from the samaj because samaj is, is the water in which we all swim. So my attention in my work and my life has been very much how do we keep on improving our samaj? How do we ourselves become better part of the samaj? But I agree completely that samaj, sarkar, bazaar have to work together to achieve any societal goal at all. So what we try to do in our work and certainly XTEP is one example of it with Nandan and I and Shankar co-founded in 2015, we have to think how can we continuously reduce the friction to cooperate. And I think there are clearly ways to do that and we saw some of that in the pandemic. When there's a higher goal that people subscribe to, everyone wants to cooperate to work towards it. And there are ways to do it. There are new technologies which can help everyone do their own part and do it with much less friction. So that's what some of the things that we now invest in do. So you want to expand a little bit about, so for about example, the how? In, yeah. Hmm. So for in Pratham books, in fact, when we started it was much before the kind of technologies that are available today were there, we, were, we saw it as a very clear partnership between civil society, between every storyteller of the country for children. We also saw a very strong role for the state. And we would go state government to state government to help make sure that children could get books in the libraries of government schools. So the state had a role. And the market, we encouraged the market because our books were free. Publishers, we wanted to improve access to books through the entire publishing industry. And if I may say so, we did have a significant impact on the bazaar of children's publishing as well. That's one example. The other one quickly is a step where 
um, the, the tech team that Nandan and Shankar set up helped the union government to set up its national teacher platform called Diksha. And also now Diksha, the government has encouraged private education sector players to uh, participate in it. So it's literally Samad Sarkar Bazaar um, through the uh, government's Diksha platform and billions, not millions, billions of learning transactions happen on that platform um, every month. It is kind of the basic public open infrastructure for learning in India. No, I think we've done an amazing job as a nation, thanks to, to people like Nandan, and whether it was building the India stack, building the Aadhaar, building now Diksha, and the new the health platform, where hopefully at some point in time, each one of us will have our medical records get anonymized and be available and ride on that. Uh, so all of this, of course, drives a whole new concern of my personal information and data going out and security has become uh, a big issue as you know so let me go back a little bit to the earlier uh, comment we were making about your philanthropy you have been a very uh, open philanthropist we have been a, you have been a vocal philanthropist you have participated in multiple philanthropies uh, you also participated in the india philanthropic initiative and this is rather unusual in India, where a lot of people are not able to, or not willing to share what they do uh, in terms of charity or philanthropic initiatives. How come you are, you are so vocal about this? And would you encourage others to do the same? Yeah, Sunil, you were part of IPI with me as well. And one of the things we realized is, yes, sure, there's a culture in our country where you say the left hand should not know what the right hand is giving. And that's very wonderful because it means that you're not going to boast about your philanthropy. You're going to do it quietly. But at a time like this in India where so much wealth is accumulating in quite a few, only a few hands to be very honest, unbelievable wealth then you have to question what is the role of that wealth in a society like ours why would societies tolerate the accumulation of private wealth so rapidly and in such a degree if it was not showing itself to do good for society at large and if we can't talk about this publicly and keep this question alive i think we don't want a culture where the wealthy are not showing any responsibility for the progress of the whole nation. So we decided that we want to be transparent, completely transparent about our giving. And uh, it took us a while to, again, overcome that cultural barrier. But we joined the giving pledge and said at least 50%. Hopefully in our lifetime of our wealth, we will give away. And I think this signaling is very important. And I think every a wealthy person in this country should find their own way of clearly and transparently signaling their own philanthropy. That's wonderful. Uh, you also said that in the Indian philanthropists need to be a little bit more audacious. Why do you think so? Well, look at you. Maybe I'm turning. See, I was a journalist. I always turn around and ask some questions myself. Why do you do Serendipity, the Arts Festival? And it's so great. I haven't come yet. I'm going to come this year. Tell us why you do. What motivates you to do something? Most people in the country, there's enough data to education, health, or charitable giving when they give. Why are you doing something so bold and different? So my belief is for any nation state to be considered successful, there are four pillars that need to be in place. One is a growing economy so the people can live a prosperous, uh, safe and prosperous life. Second is the ability to defend yourself. Third is to be able to play beyond your own borders, so be a part of geopolitics. And the fourth is to have a strong cultural underpinning. On the first three, India is doing exceedingly well. On the last one, we have slipped and we have slipped continuously for the last five centuries. So I, would, I had this conversation along with some friends of mine that we've changed the, the very model of how the arts in India were practiced or taught. The originally, the big patrons were the royalty. This started from the palaces and then went on to temples, then went to the traders. 
there were no partitions in the arts. They did not segregate theater or music or dance or crafts. So both the teaching and the practice of the arts was done collectively and was available and accessible to everybody. That has changed. Today, arts have become an exclusive domain of a very few. So our attempt was to democratize the access to the arts and to bring back the actual Indian methodology of looking at arts as a complete, as it's actually about complete life in, in almost in a sense of speaking, because we also look at food as an art form. Ah, so that's, that's precisely it. You know, if more philanthropists, my God, how much there is to do in this country, arts, culture, restoring all our archeological monuments, water, there is environment, a million things can be done to nurture our environment. There are so many other places I can think of. So I think, uh, philanthropists need to little bit take on more risky philanthropy. When I say risky, I don't mean politically risky as much as risky in terms of that you may not necessarily see the benefits happening, accruing very, very quickly. You need patient capital for a long time. You need to be able to trust civil society organizations to do what they do best because they know how to work in their context. Open up, open up, go beyond your fence and work in areas that are very, for example, mental health and so many others. If they, I think this is the time for Indian philanthropy to challenge old ideas and just innovate rapidly. I also think we need to understand the distinction uh, between donors, philanthropists and social entrepreneurs. Sure. Because each one has a role to play and each one is critical to, to the needs so, uh, but interestingly, what we find is that every generation appears to have a slightly different approach to philanthropy itself. Yeah. So, how would your daughter's, Janvi's approach, for example, differ from yours in philanthropy? So, Janvi came back with a PhD from Harvard and I thought she'll do some post doctoral research in some archaic thing, but she suddenly switched lanes and decided that she wants to uh, push her newfound passion, because when she was pregnant, she did a lot of research for doing respectful birthing in India. So she started doing a lot of research about what happens to women when they're giving birth. And I'm sorry to say she believes we do things too little, too late to give them a very decent and respectful and joyful birthing experience. So she set up both a non-profit and a for-profit to do that. Um, she's put in some of her money. She's managed to convince her parents to put in some of their philanthropic capital. And she is doing very well with Astrika Foundation. My son is part of my board and he has several ideas about how to give forward. Both of them are solidly with us on the fact that we have to be uh, give forward as much, as effectively, and as fast as we can. So, for you, uh, the exposure that you've had, you've traveled the world, you meet, uh, you know, leaders around the world in business, in politics, in society. Has your view, own view changed over this period of time that you, your exposure has increased towards society and towards philanthropy? Yes, I think um, we are at a critical juncture where people really, really need to understand the importance of civil society in democracies. You know, uh, even, even people in the corporate sector, of course people in government, uh, they are doing whatever they can to take this country forward. But you know, business cannot go below a certain line. You cannot reach those without paying capacity. Sarkar, no matter how hard it tries, cannot go to every door. It, it cannot set up such a large establishment. Who is there between the people who are left behind, the people whose aspirations are to be in this room? Very often it is civil society organizations who represent them and make their case wherever it needs to be made. And civil society organizations right now need help. I'm, you know, I'm happy that foreign donations are coming down. The government believes 
Indian money should go up and this is the time for people like all of us in this room to support whichever area you are passionate in to support civil society organizations. So I have seen the leadership skills that AIMA I am sure talks about in all its regional meetings. You will find a lot of that leadership lessons among civil society leaders. I know hundreds of them and that kind of passion of intent, that hard work, that moral leadership is something I think whether you're in government or in the corporate sector you can learn and uh, philanthropy I have learned that um, you know uh, definitely India has now a chance to show the whole world a new model of philanthropy and I hope we begin yesterday I, I think this is a it, it's a wonderful inspiring message because there is there is potential for each one of us to do something, whether we do it around ourselves, because the question actually I often ask a uh, hall like this is that I'm going to ask this question of the audience here. How many of you know the names of the children of the domestics who work in your homes? People who clean your, uh, your floors, who cook for you, who wash your clothes. May I actually ask by a show of hands, how many of you know that children's names? Thank you. So the reason for asking this question, uh, Rohini, repeatedly is that we often forget how blessed and fortunate we are to be able to make decisions and choices and say no to things. There are not many people in the world who can do this. So people who are cleaning our floors did not have this as their life ambition saying, oh, when I grow up, I'm going to clean, clean Rohini's home. Okay. Now that person does not have a choice. Can we, can we allow the children to be able to make choices? So if we can start literally from within your home, that is a very easy, but a very powerful thing to do. It enables people to truly make choices and it impacts the entire family and complete generations after that. And we have seen, I'm sure there are many people who can give examples in this room where they have helped to educate the, the, the children of people who work with them. In one generation, have we not seen such a rapid trans, trans, uh, complete transformation where somebody was working as a maid, her daughter, is, her daughter or son is now studying medicine or engineering or, you know, even becoming an entrepreneur. Of course, we can do it. This is what this is what I mean by the role of Samaj. If you want to create a better Samaj, then you have to start with yourself. Now, I can give you many, many examples, by the way, it actually works. And yeah. we often don't realize how much of this is due to opportunity, yeah. access of, to opportunity. Uh, we run a school, actually we run multiple schools and one of them in uh, Ludhiana was set up specifically and, and especially to encourage children of industrial workers to come in and, and study. When we started, the principal had a problem because children came who were four years old, eight years old and 14 years old who had never been to school. He didn't know how to handle them. Now, for the last 10, maybe 15 years, every year in Punjab, in the top 10 in the entire state, there are at least two or three kids from this very school, Fantastic. one school. Congratulations. Yeah. And they've gone on to join IITs and become doctors and all kinds of things. And, and so it just shows you, it, it's not as if any one of us is born smarter. It is about opportunity. So a large part of the philanthropy is to expand the opportunity pool. Correct. Absolutely. That's right. why it is important for those who have the ability, the capability and the resources to do it in a manner as if the same way we run our businesses and our companies. You gave me an opening when you said run our companies. Uh, I hope it, this question will be interesting to the audience. What do you think the corporate sector can do better to, to do this, build a better Samaj, create more equity of opportunity? How can corporate sector, especially today, when India needs to grow at 7, 8, whatever scorching pace that we need to grow to get all the remaining people to the level where they want to be, how are we going to do that without, with, in the, with the risks of climate change, with all the other risks that we have in terms of global supply chain? What should corporate India do differently? Especially because you have a philanthropic mindset, you very much think along those lines. I can share what we do. Yep. 
So what we've attempted to do is in all of our foundations, and we run separate foundations for every activity. We don't have one. Yeah, but I'm organ. talking about your our core businesses, not not your philanthropy. What should corporate India do? Not in terms no, 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 of I'm, CSR, but me, in their own core let, business. Let me expand and let me. Okay. You, you'll see the connection. Okay. <laughs> so what we've done is we've set up a separate foundation for every single activity, and we have very low attrition in our companies. So people who join the companies usually end up retiring from there, but they don't actually retire. When they come close to retirement, they usually say, can I join this school or this hospital or this college or this other initiative, clean drinking water, etc." So we have actually got some of the best talent available in the country running our philanthropic initiatives. We've also put in the same processes in these as we have in our companies. We've also put in ERPs in the foundations. So that's what I meant by when I said we are using our knowledge of the way we run our businesses. Hmm. We've transmitted that knowledge into these foundations. We've also set up things like KRAs, goals for them to monitor. Uh, and we actively encourage people making mistakes. Hmm. The, what I mean by making mistakes is we tell them to experiment all the time, to try hmm. and do things quicker, better, faster, easier, cheaper, lower wastage, etc. And to do that, if you have to experiment, it's absolutely fine. So fail and forward. And if you stumble, if you stumble, so what we do is in our town hall, we call up people and anyone who's done something special gets called up and gets a pat on the back. And somebody who tried but failed gets the exact same recognition. That's wonderful. Actually, in because the nonprofit sector, Every year now we have a failures conference. Maybe corporate India should have a failures conference every year. Maybe AIMA should have a failures conference where you literally are able to share in a very safe space what you learned from any failure that you might have had. And um, we find that idea has started picking up in other places as well. So what you said really rang true to me. So in, in a sense, you already asked me the question which Oh. which came in from here is saying is corporate philanthropy a strategic tool for for business so um there's another interesting one it, it says do you think philanthropy is being misused by many to get political patronage political patronage i don't think philanthropy has been misused uh... a question from the audience Mark. yeah yeah to get political patronage i don't think you can get but philanthropy can be Philanthropy can be misused certainly to get certain kinds of power. Let's be very clear. Money comes with power. Using money comes with power. And that's why to me it's very important that philanthropists always keep a mirror in front of themselves to understand that, that their power should be used only for the larger public interest. If you don't do that, yes, you can go wrong. So there's another one which... Uh... He's talking about the order of the three, uh, of Samaj, Sarkar and Samaj, uh, sorry, uh, and, and Bazaar. He says... I like it, you said Samaj, Sarkar and Samaj. You're <laughs> moving towards my side. <laughs> you forgot Bazaar, so, Sunil. <laughs> uh, but it always seems nowadays Bazaar is shaping Samaj, means the sequence is Bazaar, Sarkar and then Samaj. Yeah, actually, that's what that's how this journey of mine started uh, in terms of trying to do a lot of research about these three pillars. When one of our partners called Prem Kumar Verma, in when we were going in the middle of the night towards actually a Naxal infested district, um, and he said, you know, so much has changed. Samaj used to be the solid base, even when there were monarchs. They had to respond to the Praja. And he says, now it's all upside down and Bazaar has become so powerful. Sarkar is next and Samaj ko piche, piche dhakel diya hai. So that's when I started to think how important Samaj is. Samaj is the Neve. Samaj is the foundation. Samaj is from where the Bazaar people and the Sarkar people will come. So it has to be Samaj first. And then, of course, I think the Sarkar and the Bazaar but it's not really one, two, three at all. It's a continuum. Doesn't have very sharp borders. But I would say Samaj is the foundation. And Sarkar and Bazaar were created millennia ago. So that it could work for the larger public interest of the Samaj. 
Bazaar didn't come first, Sarkar didn't come first, Samaj came first. Sometimes what has happened today is, the bazaar is everywhere. We wake up in the morning, pick up our phones, you can buy half the world if you have the wherewithal. We have begun to think of ourselves as consumers first. And that's very dangerous. We are not consumers first. We are citizens first. We are humans first, we are consumers next. You can't keep on consuming your way out of bad governance, out of bad markets. We have to be active as citizens first. So at least that's what I've learned to believe in the 30 years that I've been in yep. this service. So this question is says, there are very few philanthropists working for elder care, where the need is increasing rapidly. Any thoughts or suggestions on this? Because world, the world is turning older and as... Uh, no, definitely, uh, Sunil, we have to start thinking about this because India is going to age very rapidly in 30 years. I, I want to interrupt for one moment here. People keep talking of the, the demographic dividend. Yeah. You actually forget in the next eight to nine years, we will also be the oldest country in the world, not only the youngest. No, I completely agree we'll with you. We have more people over 60 than almost any other country on the planet. And it's going to be frightening if we don't set in place some things now. I think with AI, I was just reading today that maybe you will have different forms of technological assistance for the future. But I would completely agree that we need a lot more philanthropy for thinking through the implications of an aging India. The Help Age and other organizations started almost 40 years ago to think about it. But I agree with you, this is one area which is quite neglected. There's some innovation happening. Uh, there are young uh, leaders who have started civil society organizations that are thinking differently about aging. I do hope more philanthropy will come in. So, while on young philanthropists, is there any advice you have for the next generation of philanthropists? Uh, people who are not yet earning but will uh, be in the coming years. Is this something you would like them to learn, train themselves in, coach themselves, counsel themselves in, to, to become better at this as they get along? Many people ask me that, many young entrepreneurs ask me that, and the best thing, best news is they're already asking that, even before they've made their first billion. They say if, if you make hundreds of millions of dollars, you're still all right. The minute you make a billion dollars, you try to change the world. And hopefully for the better, but not guaranteed to do so. So they want to know what should I do first? I think the first thing to do is don't wait. Don't wait till you become too old and too rich to really do anything. Start early. Some of the wonderful young people I know who are entrepreneurs have already joined the Founders Pledge, which says that they will give some 10% of when they sell out or they come into their first money, they will commit. In advance, they're committing that they will give 10% of that away. And there are many such models that have come out which are saying, don't wait. You owe, however brilliant you are, you owe your success to fate, destiny and luck. And you must share that forward. And so I would say, don't wait. Surely there is one thing that stirs your blood. There has to be. Find that and start work however small, but as soon as you can. Um, you know, you are so deeply involved in so many different things, at so many different places. I wonder if you actually get time for yourselves, and what do you do for fun? Uh, no, see, Nandan taught me that... Yes, this is fun. This is fun. Exactly. Nandan, Nandan and Infosys also taught me that your work and your life shouldn't be so separate, you know. It should be a continuum. Uh, the Americans started this idea of love weekend, where your life is on the weekends and your work is during the week. But that's an artificial sort of boundary. I hope everybody in this room has a job which is also rewarding for them. And so our work is rewarding for us Monday to Sunday. But we have a lot of fun also. It's not like you work morning to night at your philanthropy and uh, oh we have lots of fun we travel a lot we go into the wild a lot uh, we argue a lot it's fun at least fun for me nandan will have to speak for himself we'll have to talk to nandan separately about that <laughs> um there's a question which says that wealth comes with some social with social responsibility uh i have heard that you believe in having control, contract between wealthier people with other people of society. What is that contract? 
I think I spoke about that. I think the wealthy have a responsibility towards society. Uh, you cannot have societies where wealth is only used to benefit the wealthy. Otherwise, why would societies want to create that wealth? So I think we should be much, there should be public pressure on the wealthy. Um, uh, there is growing inequality and inequity in the world. Too much of the value of the economic spectrum is captured in only one space. You have to let that value flow all the way down. And this is something that, of course, the bazaar has to think about much more. But uh, the wealthy have a very clear responsibility. Otherwise, why should governments right now the top, I think the top uh, tax rate is about 42%. Why should government not make it 80%? 39, but okay, fine, 39%. Why should the government not make it 65%? Why should it not set up inheritance, inheritance taxes? Why should it not do other means to make sure that wealth is distributed more equitably across a society like ours? I think the wealthy have to show the reason why their wealth creation is beneficial for society. They have to do it more boldly and they have to do it in a bigger way. So, you raise an interesting uh, point here. Over the last 80 years or so, we've followed this market economy model so successfully, country after country, that it lifted many boats. And please note the word I'm using, not all boats, many boats. Uh, what it did do, however, is it created this amazing excessive disparity between the top and the bottom of the economic ladder. And it carried on for a while, for quite a while, but it did not impact, it did not create societal strife until all of this became visible. And now with the advent of technology and internet, everybody can see how exactly as you said, the super wealthy are living what they, where they spend. And the question people then tend to ask themselves, what have I done wrong? Yeah. Why is the road outside my ho home only potholes? Why can I not get my kids right. into a good school? Yeah. Why do I have only a, uh, you know one room if I have six kids? And, and so I think the compact between industry and society itself needs to undergo some change. That that compact needs to be a little bit more inclusive. And and industry and business have learned the knack and technique of doing research, finding uh, easier and more effective solutions to problems. So I think we do need to deploy more of that in uh, societal problems, in anticipating them rather than only solving them. Yeah. So we don't actually trip on them. Agreed. You know, wherever I go, I ask people, how do you, in India, do you feel optimistic about your future? 99% of the hands go up. See, right now we don't have that crisis, okay? People are seeing wealthy people spend, and that includes me, I, let me be very honest, we live a very good life. And you too, Sunil, you live a very good life, and so do many people in this room. But wherever I go, people are not yet, the young of India are not yet resentful of this kind of wealth disparity. But it really depends on how we all behave in this next decade, the next decade after that, because many constraints are coming. And we still have 300, we have 360 young people in this country below the age of, I mean, that's the population of the United States of America waiting for their turn. How the wealthy behave, how, how the markets signal their, how their businesses are going to be conducted are going to make the difference between 10 years later if I ask the people, young people in any gathering I go to, whether they're going to remain 99% putting their hands up. Yes, I'm optimistic for myself. We need a country where people, 100% of young people can raise their hands and say, I am optimistic about my future in this country. So let me ask this question. How many in this hall are optimistic about the future? This is definitely 100%. How wonderful. So a slight, slight angle here now, and, and this is the point you were making. Is there a case for a bigger focus on ethical leadership? Has there ever been a time in human history when there isn't? I think it's at the core of successful societies. If we didn't have, what do we remember when we remember even say the Roman Empire, 
Uh, we remember the decline and fall because the ethical leadership let the citizens down. So, of course, we need a very core ethical. But how do you, again, where do these ethical leaders come from? I think we have to start at home and in schools, right, to develop ethical values. So, how would you do it, Sunil? How, what do you think of the role of ethical leadership? And what so does that mean? How do you create ethical leaders? So, I think there are two parts to this. One is our behavior at home with our mm. families, with our children, because the first learning actually comes. So I'll tell you what happened. We were, you know, when we were setting up our university. So I asked our, our faculty whether we could design uh, a course on ethics and moral dilemma. And they all pushed back and saying there's no need. You know, this is not supposed to be taught in college. I said, frankly, it's not even supposed to be taught in school. It's something you learn when you're eight months old and 10 months old at home. When you see the members of your family, that what they say and what they do is actually consistent. And starting from there onwards, if you can create that consistency in your life, you don't need a special focus on it. But because we have a real issue, we have a real problem right now, there is a need for us to show ourselves a mirror now and then. And therefore, uh, to try and bring this to the fore as a need and at multiple parts of our stages in our life. Yeah, one of the things that always uh, inspires me is that when there are surveys of employees around the world, more and more of them say they want to work for companies that they consider ethical. And I think that's a huge thing because they can see what's happening around the globe and therefore it allows market markets and bazaars and companies to go beyond the idea that the business of business is only business. And that's come. I like it because it's coming from below. And um, I think, in fact, some of the ethical leadership is going to be driven by employees of the future who see the interconnections between their own lives and what their employers are doing. So, yeah, that's good. I, I, again, to be fair, I think the business of business only business is clearly history. I, yep. I, I have not heard this in recent times, almost in any conversation I've heard in any place. Uh, ESG looked like something which was a fashionable statement about yeah. 10 years ago. Yeah. Uh, today, companies are seriously looking inward and saying, what is it I can do? Not just have an officer designated, but what is it that we can do in our actual behavior, in the DNA of an organization to, to be a more effective organization? And, and you're right, it is actually giving companies more value in the stock market mm -hmm. and becoming a more attractive employer uh, and, and therefore giving them an advantage in the very business itself. So this Precisely. is, this is uh, something which in some sense is almost inseparable. And the moment we understand that, you don't actually have to make an extra effort for this. Do you think it's yeah. going to take more regulation or will it come from within? I think it's a combination because the big push has come with regulation. That is for sure. Earlier you had some companies who stood apart because they behaved in a certain manner whereas many others did not. Uh, today you are seeing more and more uh, either actually doing it or at, least, or at least trying to show that they're doing it. I'm frankly happy even that they're just trying to show it because what happens after that is your behavior does tend, tend to change. True. You tend to follow that uh, yeah. you know, once you start to, to pretend. It has you, its own rewards also. Ab absolutely, yeah. Yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So I think we're running out of time. I have a couple of more questions, which I'm, I'm afraid we will not be able to take. But Rohini, thank you very much for this wonderful conversation. You're an absolute inspiration to, to just so many of us. Thank you, Sunil, um, you. for being such a great moderator. And thank you for being such a role model. You are. Thank you so much, Aima, for having me. I'm not a typical speaker here at a management association. Congratulations for 50 years of this convention. That is really something. Congratulations, Ayama. Thank you. Dhanyavad. Namaste. Rohini, you're a superwoman. Thank you.